Let me uh, introduce Captain Iris. Uh, she is the captain and I assume owner of uh, Selena uh, Sailing. That is with an I. You would have gotten my email a week earlier if I'd realized that it was Selena and not Selena. Um, it's Selena. It's Selena. <laughs> Selena, okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, I will pass it over to her. Uh, if I could ask everyone as she talks rather than interrupt, we'll take the questions at the end. If you will write them as they come to mind in the chat box, I will uh, repeat those back at the end in, in some kind of logical grouping if I can do that. Um, so with that, uh, let me um, put your presentation up or if you want any opening comments, go ahead. Well, you're um, welcome to put the first photo if you want up and I will talk over it and then we'll go through the photos. So, um, oh, well, uh, hello, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm very flattered <laughs> to be asked to give a talk. Uh, the talk title when it came through was a little daunting. I thought I need to talk about my connection to historic wooden boats and my grandfather's yacht and uh, the Sail Salina two charter business in St. Michael's. And that's basically three talks. I thought, oh my goodness, <laughs> I'm gonna suspect that you are all more interested in the charter boat business than the, the first two um, bits. But um, I thought I would at least start with those with a, a, a quick broad brush and then get into the charter boat business. And actually questions would be quite helpful for me because I would, um, rather speak to the areas you're interested in than just um, kind of wing it. So uh, at any rate, let's see. Um, some background. For starters, I grew up on the east end of Long Island, New York. That is where Salina was built in 1926. Um, I learned to sail on the smallest cat boat there was. I don't know if any of you guys know um, the, the smallest uh, cat boat there is, it's a wood pussy. And um, her name was Red Tape because before my family got her, she had been painted red and she leaked so badly it wasn't worth fixing her. So my brother tried to slow leaks down by, you got it. He made patches out of duct tape. So we called her Red Tape. And I'm gonna guess all of you remember the cutoff Clorox bottles floating around in your boats as a kid. You might even have one today in your dinghy. Well, there was always one of them cut off in red tape and we would furiously use it to bail her whenever we took her out for a sail. I guess I learned some kind of skills sailing a sinking boat, <laughs> but what I really remember was trying to get back to shore before I got soaked because I didn't like getting wet. I didn't like being salty and sticky and I didn't like being cold. So, uh, dragging a half swamp boat is really hard work. So I got good at bailing as a kid. And I don't know why I still like old wooden boats, <laughs> given that that was my introduction. But uh, the other part of my childhood was being out on my grandfather's cat boat. Salina is the largest surviving of any of the cat boats. I didn't know if you guys might know that. She is 41 on deck. 44 with the boom hanging out the back. She sat out in front of my people's place on a mooring when I was a kid, and we would hear stories of her first captain, Captain Frank Payne, uh, going out every day to bail her out. Um, that was before automatic bilge pumps, and she had been built without a rabbit in the skeg for the garboard to seat in properly, so she le leaked like a sieve um, just as badly as red tape. <laughs> My family was, was uh, first, I guess, with leaky boats. Being 42 feet long, I can only imagine there was a ton more water to bail out. But fortunately, by the time we kids came along, it was my dad trying to keep batteries charged to keep her afloat and not us on the bucket brigade. So my connection to wooden boats was that when I was young, I thought they were always soggy and had the old wooden boat smell. Um, I loved sailing just the same, and I was always the kid aboard helping out and manning the sheets on the few occasions Salina II was sailed in my childhood. My grandfather had her built uh, to make my, my grandmother happy not to go sailing, and as I mentioned, the uh, extreme leaking uh, made it um, 
a bit onerous to uh, sail her that required a bucket brigade, six men haw, uh, bailing furiously with buckets over the side. So it was once to twice a summer in my mother's childhood that she was sailed and really that or less in my childhood. But um, you, if you've known her name is Salina the second and that's because it's my just food pickle. Sorry. Did I heard somebody say something? I tell you what, can we go to the next photo? There we go. So um, this had been the, the photo that's up now had been my grandparents first boat. And she was this long skinny power boat on tippy. If you go to the next photo, you're gonna, uh, that's my grandparents on board. You can go to the next photo. There, you can see how skinny this boat was. And it was quite tippy and made my grandmother quite nervous. So uh, they had been out on her on the east end of Long Island. You guys, I don't know if it, it was true for you, but I know a lot of captain's license tests have a chart on the east end of Long Island into Gardner's Bay up into Rhode Island. That is the area that um, Salina and Salina II uh, um, were used in. And between Orient Point and Plum Gut, it can get pretty rough. I don't know if any of you have been through that waterway, but this particular skinny boat you're looking at got side two in a rough chop there and tipped so violently that water slopped over the side. And my grandmother just, um, I, I can only imagine when they got back to the dock, get rid of the boat. <laughs> So that happened, and within a year's time, my grandparents were invited to uh, go sailing on a, another friend's cat boat. And because cats are half as wide as they are long, you can go to the next photo. Um, they are, and you can, you know what, you can just go through these photos at, a, at whatever pace you think is good. This is Captain Frank with my uncle aboard the original Salina. Those are the next photo. But this is the very first photo we have of Salina the second. So my grandparents were sailing on a cat boat, half as wide as they are long, very stable. Made my grandmother feel comfortable. So she encouraged my grandfather to have another boat built. You can go to the next slide. And um, here she is with her sail up. That is an, uh, a long strand Egyptian cotton canvas, apparently weighed a gajillion pounds, took several men to raise it. Today, uh, the Dacron sail that I have, it's um, o Oceana, made by North Sails. Uh, the fabric is, the, the sail we are sailing was actually crafted up in Nathaniel Wilson's sail loft in Booth Bay Harbor in uh, 2017. And one man, and actually one big woman can raise the sail now on it by themselves. But yeah, thank you. This is Captain Frank in the middle. My grandfather was a, a, a very affluent man. He could not only afford to have his toys built, but he had her professionally staffed. So um, you can uh, see him as he's taking the family out. Thank you, just keep going through those and I'll tell stories as you go. Um, I mentioned, there's, that's my grandfather. And you can see he's, he's in a yachtsman's attire with a sports jacket and bow tie. They dressed to go boating back in the late 20s and 30s. This, this photograph will have been from the 1930s, but you can see they're still all bobbing uh, their hair in the 1920s style. So you can go to the next photo. That's Captain Frank. So if you go back and forth between those two photos, you can really see the difference. Here, Captain Frank is in livery, almost like a butler would wear, and um, at the helm, taking the family for a ride. In most of the shots that I uh, can find in the family archives, the boom crutch is always in place. Again, very rarely sailed. But the photos that you saw earlier of her with her sails up while she's tied at the dock are to air the sails out and let them dry, old timey style. You can go to the next um, slide. There's Captain Frank down below. It's one of the only photos I have of below decks in yesteryear. And you can see the staving, the painted staving inside. It's, uh, and the uh, cushions are velvet, 
dark green velvet with the buttons in them. <laughs> it doesn't look like that anymore. All right, next shot. Uh, just a family shot, people out. Next shot. Uh, so, so I had edited these out, um, but we can go through them quickly. We'll just, just, just go. <laughs> this is the Hurricane of 38. She got away from the dock where she was tied up and landed here. And it's hard to see from this angle, but the pilings are through the side of the boat. Extensive damage. She's been through any number of hurricanes over the last 96 years, but this hurricane and Hurricane Bob were the two that she really suffered some damage. You can go to the next photo. This is a photograph of her during Operation Sail in 1976. She was the only boat to carry a single sail. And you can see how dark, she, she's the sailboat right smack dab in the middle with the gaff rig, the dark sail, that's it, that's correct. Um, it is quite dark because by 1976, that Egyptian cotton canvas was mildewed black. Next slide. Oh, that's a close up. Next slide. slide. Um, this is in the 1980s. She had gotten soggy. The ribs had broken. And you can just really go fast through all of these slides. Uh, um, and uh, uh, they opted to, to rebuild her. Uh, they didn't rebuild her, keep going, just you know, go in a real quick face, a space pace going through these. Uh, my, my parents, my mother at the helm. My mother was the sailor, really. You can keep going. And there they are again. That's a, quite a different from the 1920s. <laughs> There's my dad aboard, keep going. Ah, this is later. Um, this is now much more recently. And there was a question about her maintenance. Um, when I got Salina, she wasn't in the best of shape. I bet I uh, spent a year restoring her. And subsequently, uh, every year we pull her out of the water and we paint her every year. So this is when she's in the sanding phase. You can go to the next slide. And um, you can see occasionally a fastener goes bad. This is a Dutchman that's been being put in under at the, at the uh, water line, the, the bootstripe. You can go to the next photo. And here we're replacing a plank. Something uh, wasn't quite right and my shipwright didn't like it. And um, this is with the plank off. Next slide. And here she is having her transom varnished. Next slide. And uh, just a workshop view of her in the house. Next slide. Uh, some work happening in her uh, um, hold under the cockpit sole. Next slide. Engine work. Next slide. This is her cockpit again. And I put these slides in out of interest. Um, in the middle of the slide, where there's vertical staving that's quite dark. The paneling on top that had covered it over uh, had gone bad. And when we took that paneling it off, it revealed the original staving. We go to the next slide. I opted not, and you can go to the next slide. I opted not to go back to the staving. It was too big a project for me. So we went over it again with the paneling. So you can go to the next slide. Getting a fresh coat of paint. This guy is a genius with a paintbrush. Next slide. And her blocks. I spend a week every year maintaining her blocks. We take them out and repack the uh, grease on the roller. Next slide. And varnish them up before we put them back together again. Next slide. Just bits and pieces that have been varnished that are gonna get put on the boat. Next slide. And me. Um, uh, installing the skylights. Next slide. And all put together in a sunset champagne cruise. Next slide. And guests aboard, having a good time. Next slide. And you can just go through these at this pace. That's an engagement. She's showing off her ring. My first mate, Frank. Next slide. A wine tasting cruise. Everybody seems to like that. Been very popular this year. Next slide. And uh, we sometimes do a crab cake lunch by special arrangement. Next slide. 
or weddings. This is in anticipation of the bride getting a board. Next slide. We've had um, photo shoots on the board. JC Penny, J uh, Crew came, um, any number of clothing. And um, gosh, we did uh, one of the clips of House Hunters. Next slide. Uh, just some interior shots. You can go through these quickly, Captain Davis. So this is what she looks like down below nowadays. Keep going. Keep going. There we go. Keep going. Um, uh, one of these guests brought their own chair. I thought that was pretty fun. <laughs> Next slide. First mate Frank doing some on the fly maintenance. Next slide. We get that occasionally. I'm king of the world. Next slide. Ladies night. Next slide. Working on the maintenance is never ending. It, uh, even in the middle of the summer, we're sanding and varnishing. Next slide. Uh, that was early on. I was very proud with TripAdvisor that we'd gotten five stars for that year. Next slide. Um, just a fun outing. People having a great time. Next slide. Yep. Um, we go out even in bad weather. What the heck? Who cares? Next slide. And you can just run through these, Captain. There we go, wedding. Future Captain. <laughs> Champagne cruise. More champagne. We serve a lot of champagne. This is one of my mates having a good time catching a crab, just swimming on the surface. These I threw in to show you how beamy she is. She's 16 feet. She's not as wide as cat, and that's the last slide. She's not as wide as cat boats should be, but um, but she's plenty wide. She she keeps us busy. <laughs> Uh, so, um, uh, if you, so at this point, if you want to do questions or answers, or I can read some other stories of, out of her history, um, if you'd like me to talk a little about, about getting her started in the charter boat business, the story behind that was that when I got the boat, my dad, really life-changing question, I said, dad, how much do you spend every year to maintain her? And when he told me, um, I just about choked. I was like, oh my God, it was a big number. It was more money than I had to spend as a discretionary income. And the boat wasn't in the best of shape. So the number needed to be bigger. And I did what many people before me have done. I decided to ask the boat to help. I hung out a shingle, it said sailboat rides. Um, so we started inviting guests aboard in 2004 and have been taking people ever since. So why don't I just stop talking there and uh, start taking questions and, and I, I um, make the, the um, uh, how many outings, oh, I, it came and went. I thought somebody was gonna read those out loud to me, but uh, um, can you put that up on the screen again? Uh, I'm not sure how to get them on your screen, but I'll relay them. Um, what has been your most memorable or inter interesting outing on board? That's a great question. Um, there are so many, it's hard, hard to answer. So um, there's a gambit. So for example, some of my the favorite comments people have made to me, one was um, that they, they felt like, oh my goodness, I've been on a flying magic carpet ride. Another was that uh, Salina was built to make my grandfather, grandmother feel safe. And I think the boat takes that very seriously and she makes people feel welcome. She makes them feel secure. And uh, I had a guest get off one time and say, Cat Myers, I just want to tell you, I feel like I've been hugged. <laughs> I thought that was just very charming. Um, memorable. Weddings are always uh, uh, amazing that people share that intimate point in their lives with us. And instead of meeting as we do in everyday life where we show the outmost of our mask when we first meet and it takes a while until we, we let down the protective layers and are much more 
um, revealing of our inner selves with our wedding couples. They reveal themselves to us right away. And it's fabulous to meet people with no masks. And so that's tremendously rewarding. Um, we've had so many engagements and it's very similar where they're, they're, they're so genuine and outpouring. We tend to get anniversaries. And so when we ask their stories, how did you meet? Or well, why did you marry this man? Again, we do a, a deep dive very quickly with folks. So that's been uh, um, uh, an honor to be included in people's lives in that way. Um, there are memorable moments where things have gone wrong. I don't know if you want to hear the horror stories. They're not proud moments, um, but we're here and the boat's still floating and nobody's ever been hurt, thank God. Uh, with, um, with one exception, uh, getting people on, and everybody knows this, boarding and disembarking is tricky. And uh, we unfortunately had somebody who decided to step absolutely between the boat and the dock. They just stepped off the boat in between the boat and the dock. And it was terrifying for everybody. Um, fortunately, the damage uh, um, that she suffered was not uh, too, too over the top and she didn't sue me for everything I'm worth. Um, so I still have a retirement, oh my God. Uh, but um, we changed, we already had some pretty stringent protocol for getting people on and off the boat, what we thought was safely. But what we ended up doing was building the dock out. So we have minimized the space between the dock and the boat. And I would be happy to send anybody photographs of that that would are, are interested because that, that certainly had been my fear um, with guests. I, there was never anything else to be frightened out about safety wise, except that piece of the puzzle. And I, uh, we, I can't say that it's completely mitigated now, but boy, the chance of somebody stepping between the boat and the dock now has diminished dramatically because of, of extending the planking on the dock out to minimize the distance. Quick questions. A few more coming in. Uh, what is your average? I think some of these you, we talked about before everybody got on, so. All right. You can feel free to repeat. How many outings a year do you typically average? So um, we start up the last weekend in April. St. Michael's used to have a fabulous wine festival and it seemed like a good time to get started. <laughs> and we run to the last uh, Sunday in October. So it's just a little over six months, maybe six months in a week, something like that. And um, earlier on when I first started the business, uh, the end of April was very light. Um, the beginning of May was light and then it would build up. But uh, COVID changed everything as it has for everybody everywhere. Um, I don't know what it will be like this season, but last season um, we hit the ground wide open. We were sold out the first day, the Friday uh, before the last weekend in April. We were sold out 10 to 12, 12.30 to 2.30, 3 to 5, 5.30 to 7.30, 7.30 to 9.30. We had 30 people on board the first day out of the box. Saturday, we were sold out. Sunday, we were sold out. Monday, we had five, uh, four out of the five outings. And Tuesday, four out of the five. And what, I mean, we just, uh, people couldn't get out enough. Last, last year was aberrant. I, I can't imagine it will be like that again this year, particularly with the threat of the recession. They're pounding the tom-toms hard on us now, right? Everything's gonna cost more and there's gonna be this terrible recession. Hold on to your money. That's the message that we're getting sent. And um, I don't know what that's gonna do to, I think there's gonna be a drawdown on the economy. Uh, and I think that it's gonna be self-fulfilling. You know, don't spend your money and be scared to do it because there isn't going to be that much money coming around. They're even scaring you in the supermarket, the supply, the supply chain, and there isn't going to be food. There's going to be a food shortage, shortage. And I think that we're going to see less ridership this year. I hope I am wrong. I well, really. Let me, let me tie that into a, a personal issue we dealt with uh, last year, um, and sounds like you had the same thing. While good thing and a bad thing. We were so busy, we let maintenance slide. 
Um, so kind of tying in a uh, question about annual maintenance, both in the season, off season, um, how much typically you average on what is your average maintenance budget. And of course, it's a little bit different maintaining a wooden boat that's historic. Um, yes. So maybe comment on some of those. Great. And I, I, uh, don't let me forget, because I actually had a question pop up on my screen, which was how much do I charge each trip? So if you could also uh, jog my memory to answer that. Maintenance. So um, we do have our annual maintenance. And then when we're in season, we have daily maintenance, we have weekly maintenance, and we have monthly maintenance. And we also have um, a uh, maintenance schedule that is every other month around her varnish, which the rest of you guys don't have, right? But um, the checklists for the daily maintenance are things that will resonate with all of you. We retie the lines to make it easier for guests to get aboard. We uh, check all the coolers and ice them down. We clean all the bird, bird poop off of the boat and get her spiffy clean. We set up the cockpit. We have a rug in the cockpit, her captain's chairs, her settee cushions, her ensign. And then we have the complete engine check to make sure that everything around that um, is 100% is operational checking fuel. You guys don't have to do that because you have gauges. We don't have that. I have the old timey sticks that you stick down into the fuel tank and pull out and it tells you how much <laughs> fuel you have by how much of the stick is covered with fuel. Um, so there's a, a list that goes through. It takes us about an hour to set the boat up in the morning. I'm, I'm really rigorous when it comes to cleaning. I'm OCD and that uh, somebody said, well, that's probably a difficult thing for you in your personal life, but it's probably a really good thing for your boat because she's still floating because you pay attention to the details. And I can tell you that we get complimented on the boat all the time, not just because she's beautiful, but we hear all the time how clean she is during COVID, people felt very safe on board. We made a point of waiting to do the wipe down in between each outing where people were watching us. They're standing on board, they're waiting to board and we don't board them until they've watched us wipe everything down. So that really resonated with people and we're still doing it because we're not quite out of the we still have people that have elderly parents. Nobody seems to be concerned for themselves anymore, but I do hear concern for visiting elder parents. So we've kept up with that cleaning regimen in front. Um, weekly, we do things like uh, clean off the pilings that, uh, that, are, uh, that the boat is uh, tied in front of because when they walk up to the boat, I want that area around the boat to be pretty. I, I, I just want to clean. I want that to have that, that feeling. Um, we have chairs that people can sit in, they need to be cleaned. The sandwich board that marks it needs to be clean, making sure that brochures are where they need to be. I can share checklists with people if they want, they're exhaustive. Um, the monthly maintenance uh, gets into things like oil change and checking the strainers to make sure that the raw water coming into the engine is gonna get there. Um, is this too much detail? Uh, but so, so that's, those are the kinds of things that we do. Uh, weekly is probably pump out, fueling up. Um, it's just off the top of my head. I could pull my lists up, but, but that's what we do. Every other month, I have a varnish guy that comes to the boat. He gets there at dawn when it's sun, sun uh, rise. And uh, we have somebody wipe the boat down so he can be sanding and he sands before and finishes before nine o'clock in the morning so that we can set up to be sailing at 10. However many days it takes him to prep, then there's one morning that when we figure out the weather, we, sh we close the 10 to 12 outing. So we don't take a charter that day. He gets on board at oh dark 30 <laughs> and make sure there's going to be no due set. So we really have to coordinate weather and closing the boat and not chartering. And he'll come and he'll put varnish on. That brush is done varnishing by 10 o'clock. The boat has two hours to set up and we take her out green 
that varnish is green. It's tack, I mean, it's tack dry, but we're seriously careful about how we function. And then we start taking guests again. It's, it's just what we do because the a varnished surface, am I gonna bore anybody getting into this? No, okay, all right. No, the varnish, no. Uh, okay. absolutely not. <laughs> well, with varnish, um, the, the varnish keeps moisture and air from getting to the wood. And when you have a tiny little fissure in that varnish, whether somebody has kicked it with their shoe or their camera uh, um, swung and hit into it, or they, they sat down and their ring, their ring hit it, or I mean, we have so much varnish surface that people's belts, you know, they stand up against something, or their shoes, who knows? but we can't necessarily see the damage. It can be microscopic, but if air or water gets in there, then the wood can begin to turn color or the varnish can begin to separate from the wood. And if you catch it in time, it is true that a stitch in time saves nine. So it's not that the varnish isn't still shiny after two months, because when we commission her in the spring, she has a fresh coat of varnish. Let me tell you what, that boat look mate right now, because we're on our third day, fourth, fourth day of the season, it looks like it's wet. I mean, that varnish is beautiful. It's not that it isn't shiny still in two months. It's that there could be a microscopic fissure. There are microscopic fissures. We just don't see them. And if we varnish the whole boat again, we're, we're keeping the varnish from getting away from us, from there getting to be a problem. I hope that answered that question. <laughs> but so. quick question, what, what brand of varnish do you use? <laughs> oh, that's a long conversation. I'll try to make it short and sweet. So, um, so for areas that have high abrasion, mm -hmm. like my gaff spar, and like the arm handles to the captain's chairs, the chairs on Salina are only ever her second set. Her original chairs were rattan, which is what would be from the 1920s. But they went bad by 1950. They needed to be replaced. That's 25 years. That's a pretty good run for a rattan chair. But um, they replaced them with captain's chairs that could be folded. You might think of them as director's chairs, the movie, right? And they're wood and varnished. Who to thunk? You know, oh my God, I don't have enough varnish, but the chairs are varnished too. Oh my. And people have uh, sunscreen on, and when they put their hands down on the arms, yeah. the, the sunscreen gets all over the varnish, and traditional varnish gets eaten by sunscreen. Yeah. So we use a polyurethane on those, mm -hmm. and I'm using all grip. It's an all, um, mm, okay. an, uh, all wood is an all, all grip yeah. product, the all wood. I use that because the sunscreen doesn't eat the all wood. All right, all wood for me is a nightmare because we keep up with the varnish, we're, we're constant and on top of it, all wood is very hard to refresh. You can do it, but it's a lot more work to refresh all wood. So we limit our all wood to things that have abrasion um, are at high risk. Um, and then for the majority of the rest of the boat, uh, I use flagship, the 2015. Mm -hmm. It has wonderful, rich luster yeah. to it. Yeah. That all your things don't have captain's varnish doesn't have and captain's varnish doesn't hold up as well either mm -hmm. in my opinion the the flagship holds up much more i love the rich luster people comment on it all the time it doesn't have the brassy shininess that the all wood does actually the all wood is a little bit uh, um like uh too much too much makeup on a woman it's just too shiny it's mm -hmm. too it's it's it, it doesn't have the luster doesn't have the richness. Um, That's good. Thank question. you. I was that was the uh, assistant to the head painter man varnish man at a wooden oh. boat yard for a year. So oh. I did all the surface prep, etc. And it had to be flawless as the surface prep because that's even more important than laying on the coat. Thank all you. Right. Well, I can I can talk to surface prep just briefly to your point. So we sand, but we mm -hmm. use a couple of different types of sandpaper. Um, my favorite is the gold paper mm -hmm. um, because of the, the fact that it, it doesn't clog. So it lasts a lot longer. You don't right. have, right? But, but it's it, got some tooth. It, it, well, it, it does have tooth, uh, but um, it, it lasts longer. So I use mm -hmm. the gold. 
But the reason it doesn't clog is it has resist in it. And that resist uh, gets onto the, the, the wood itself. Mm -hmm. And you have to be very careful when you're cleaning, when you're prepping, you know, yes, you, you dust it off and yes, you take an alcohol wipe, but we do alcohol wipe and then we do an acetone wipe. Yeah. We really wipe down so that you don't have that resistance so that your varnish does stick. Otherwise mm -hmm. it feel off. So I would caution people that you're right. The prep is the big part. And what we do after that is we, it, depending on all the little bits and pieces that we can take off, we use compressed air. We blow them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The very last thing we do, we don't use tack rag is the last thing. We use compressed air. Okay. Yeah, it cleans it off. On the boat itself, yes, tack. But on anything that we can blow, we blow. We vacuum and we blow. <laughs> so we're... Yeah, you're right. It's 95% uh, of the job. Putting the varnish on is not the big deal. Yeah. And uh, I have a quick question, Captain. Yeah. Uh, we have all listened to your uh, comments on maintenance. How come you're still smiling? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a proud mama. I have a beautiful boat. Um, and, you know, my, my personal story, my backstory, was that I was the kid growing up on the boat with two older siblings, but with, uh, they were both boys and the patriarchal thing would have been to give it to the eldest son, right? But I was the kid aboard that had the interest. I'm the sailor in the family. And everybody knew really by the time maybe I was 12 years old that she was coming to me. And um, she's been a joy, you know, it's an honor. Yes, it's, there's a huge onus, in maintaining her, but she has given me great joy. And we take I, you know, upwards of 30 people a day, seven days a week for six months, do the math. We have taken thousands of people sailing on her now. And it is very rare that somebody doesn't realize that they're on a private family yacht. You know, it's an oxymoron because she's a commercial charter boat, right? But she's my family's yacht and everybody gets it and they get how special she is and how much the boat really takes it seriously to make everyone feel welcome and safe. Um, she got my family home every single time, even when there were stories. I mean, I can tell you stories about when she woulda, coulda, shoulda sunk, but she made it her business to get my family back safely to the dock and people get it. And so she's given everybody else joy and that gives me joy. So it makes me happy. You know, I, I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a privilege. I'm just, I'm, I'm blessed. So I'm asking myself, where were you when I needed you? My second, my first boat was a wooden boat. My second boat was a wooden boat. 1904 y'all, 1904, built, uh, built by the Wilson Yard in Baltimore. And uh. I, and I know about maintenance, so <laughs> your, your story rings true, I, I assure you. Well, I did a lot of it myself for a long time, but we now have enough people coming that I make enough little extra money that I can pay someone to help me. So I have some help now, <laughs> and maybe that's why I'm smiling. <laughs> good, good, yeah. Captain, uh, and, I, have you ever thought of um, writing a memoir? No, I'm not a writer. I'm, um, a, story, I'm a story. I'm not a writer, but I, I read all kinds of stuff that, that communicates the joy you have in the boat, the pride of ownership, the caretaker ethos, et cetera. And if you could find somebody that would do an as told to, I think your story would be marvelous with pictures and uh, someone who could write and communicate the joy that you've just communicated to us. If that think person that person shows up on my doorstep and says, I want to do this. I'd say, come on in. Well, I'm not going to look for them. I got enough. I'm busy. I'm too busy to do that. <laughs> I'll save that for my retirement project. <laughs> You're not going to retire. Well, let me, I, I, read up. A, I read a question on the screen that was the one about um, how much do I charge? And it's a great story. When I first started chartering, I had a good piece of advice and thank God I followed it. Somebody said, whatever you do, charge more than everybody else. It's like, mm -hmm. what? Mm -hmm. They said, charge more than everybody else because um, 
you for you're not going to step on so many toes people aren't going to feel that you're competitive they aren't going to feel like you're undercutting them and the a clientele that you're going to service is going to be a higher cut mm -hmm. um uh, and um you're going to make more money and really what you want to do is you don't want to take a piece of the pie you want to make a second pie and it worked. It worked great. And people ask me occasionally about my comp, my competitors, and I can honestly say, I don't have any competitors. I have colleagues. Yeah. I have colleagues. Every, everybody here in St. Michael's, we all work together. And um, I lead the pack. I, I, I mean, I, I'm, 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 I'm. I hope that doesn't sound egotistical, but I've got the, I've got this beautiful boat with a beautiful offering. And it's unique, and I uh, positioned it to be the high-end go-to, have a, uh, an, mm -hmm. a stellar experience. That is, if, if you read our reviews on TripAdvisor, on Google, <laughs> on Yelp, you know, Yelpers like to bitch about everything. We get five-star reviews on Yelp. Oh, my God, it's fabulous. Um, although the bad reviews we do get occasionally when there's an oops there come up on Yelp so you can learn from my mistakes if you read our bad reviews you'll you'll, you'll find but I take that um uh, all our reviews seriously if I get anything other than a five-star review I want to know why and I'm going to fix it I take it really really seriously and it has made us a, a, a top-notch operation because even if it seems unreasonable that somebody what somebody said it's like no that was their experience. Something wasn't right. We need to fix that. So um, anyhow, anyhow, so that's my answer to how much do we charge? Uh, we charge more than everybody else because um, because we're worth it. Uh, no, <laughs> uh, because it positions us differently. And we can't take us. So there are a couple of boats in town that take um, 24 pack of passengers. There's another boat that would take 50 some odd passengers. And um, I can't afford to be charging 35 bucks a head. You know, I, I, that isn't going to work. I can only take six at a time. I got a limited number of people I can carry every day. So, um, yes, another one from the chat. Um, I think I, I speak for this too. I've seen you several times in St. Michael's um, going in and out and sometimes very slowly. Uh, oh, yeah. How, Many times do you sail versus motoring, especially oh. given light summer winds? Oh, we, we put the sail up every single trip, except when it's over 12, 13 knots. Anything underneath that, if there is from, from zero, we put up sails if there is not a breath of wind. And then we sit there and everybody oohs and ahs and we talk about gaff rigs and we talk about um, the traditional way that line of sail is cut, which are vertical panels versus horizontal. And so we can talk about a lot of stuff while the sail's sitting there, um, particularly when there's no wind and the sun is beating down on you and it's hot as Hades and people are beginning to melt. That is when you look over at them and you say, um, would anybody, I just, does everybody want to still sail because we're not moving? Or would you like me to turn the engines on and just maybe putt putt, make a little bit of breeze and go and do the mansion tour up Leeds Creek? I know a lot about these beautiful homes. It's a gorgeous place. And it doesn't take but half a microsecond for one of the guests to go, that sounds lovely. <laughs> so we putt putt up into Leeds Creek and I know a tremendous amount about all the houses in Leeds Creek and people enjoy the mansion tour. Mm -hmm. So. We do that. I've gotten that as well as a sailor and sometimes racer. I want boats to go fast. And I had clients <laughs> actually say, why do you care? We're out here for a sunset and we don't care if we're really moving. So I back down. Um, I have a, a more business question. Maybe this will lead into some others. Um, there was one early on uh, that we talked about a little bit before formal meeting started, but um, Kind of talk about your pre-sale customer contact and um, kind of both sure. advertising, but direct communication with people when they sign up, or how do you how do you handle that? Well, we have an online booking platform, 
And I would say the majority of our bookings now, and that would be maybe 60, 65%, majority, I don't know if you consider that the majority, but maybe 60, 65% of our bookings are online and people just show up. Let me tell you, the first year that happened, I held my breath because I'd never talked to these people. I was like, are they really going to show up? And they do. It's, it's fabulous. But our phone does ring a lot. I can tell you the number one question we get. If you go and look at my website, it says we only carry six passengers. And under our policies about six passengers, it says it doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are or how much you weigh. Six adults and an infant is seven people. We can only carry six. You know, I don't care that you all weigh 50 pounds instead of 200 pounds. You can only take six. It doesn't just, it's clear as day and night. So my phone rings invariably. I'd say maybe one out of five phone calls is, we're a group of seven. Is there anything you can do to fit us on? I get the, I mean, it's just, it's people call. And um, actually what I ended up doing was contacting one of the other charter boats in St. Michael's. And I said, I have a lot of people that call me. Can I be a booking agent for you? I'll help you out. I'll book these folks, and and you you give me a, you give me a thank you, you know, ten percent. And I did over ten thousand dollars worth booked over ten thousand dollars worth of business for one of my colleagues last summer. That's really easy because it helps potential intel that we're going to be mine that aren't. I can't take them, but later on they're going to be in the harbor. They're going to see my boat. Maybe they're going to be the two of them. They really wanted to go on my boat, but they can't because they're a bigger group. And then. They have a win, um, a winning experience when they call because they didn't get, no, we can't take you. They got, well, you can't go to Salina, but I can help you out. I can book you on blah, blah, blah. And so we do that, right? Um, well, most- speaking of your, your competitors as colleagues, hopefully yeah. they're throwing you some business too. Gosh, yes. Oh, gosh, yes. You know, uh, Captain John um, on the Patriot, John uh, um, Mara, he is constantly, when he's uh, on the phone. I'm listening to something. Patriot goes right by us all the time. I can hear him say, and that's Captain Iris on this line. She's the hardest working captain. And you definitely want to go for a ride with her sometime if you have the opportunity. He talks about us all the time. God bless him. And I have people that get aboard and say, Captain John on the Patriot sent us. So yes, they, they, they send me business all the time. We go back and forth. You know, when I get a, a, somebody that contacts us because we on our website talk about weddings, nautical weddings, and most of the time people are looking for 50 to 100 people. And I just can't do that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I'm always sending a Patriot that. Um, they get a lot of wedding business uh, referred from us. So yeah, that works. Well, this is sort of a business logistic question. Um, understanding your champagne cruises and your wine cruises, do you have a liquor license? Do you? Oh yeah. How okay. hard was that to get? Um, well, I got it twenty years ago. Twenty years ago, that wasn't hard to get. Now I can't. I can't tell you. But um, I'm just trying to do this so I'm not completely in the dark without blinding myself. There we go. So uh, I don't know what it would be involved today. And I, I have no idea. 20 years ago, it wasn't that hard because we are a waterborne license. The waterborne um, was a big difference. Land licenses were very difficult then. And if you didn't know it and you try to go get a license, your business does not have the license. The individual has the license. You know, it's associated with the business, but the, uh, the business, the license goes to an individual because they want a person responsible, not some amorphic, uh, you know, uh, um, LLC that, that, that can just disappear, right? So, but yes, I have a liquor license. Take a couple more questions. I'm going to kind of group these. Um, having a wood boat on the Chesapeake is, a, you've talked a lot about what you do. If yeah. you had it to do again or if you didn't have the family connection to the boat would you get a wooden boat and i'll go ahead and pitch the second kind of part of that um you're right there in one of the best historic marine museums in the country uh what is your relationship or do you get any help from uh the museum there 
Oh, that's very interesting. Nothing from the museum, big fat zero. In all the years I've been there, they, what, what they do do, what they do do is they have my brochure. They have my brochure. And the docents will, um, will mention me from time to time. So I'm sure that, that, that it has some effect, but um, I, I really very rarely have somebody show up and say, we were at the Maritime Museum and they said we should go sailing with you. I say rarely. That probably happens three or four times a summer. It's, it, I couldn't make a living from, from their referrals. Um, they have the winning Estelle. They try to put the maritime um, patrons on their own boat. And rightly so. Winnie Estelle is lovely. And they, they, they um, have a, 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 a story that ties to the maritime museum experience, right? Um, but uh, what really does help me in terms of community are the hoteliers, the B&B operators, the Airbnb folks. Um, I do my darndest to get brochures in front of all those folks. Uh, I try to invite folks uh, in the restaurants to come out for a sale with me. I've really never managed. And so why don't you come for a sale sometime? And they're like, oh, we're really busy with our business, which they are. <laughs> um, but uh, the community, uh, the, the, the retailers, the restaurateurs um, have all been tremendously supportive. And uh, um, it, again, it's probably that colleague thing because if somebody says, what is there to do in St. Michael's? I always mention the, the retail I said, well, one of the things is we've got really neat shops up and down the, the main drag. What do you, are you, do you like clothing or jewelry? You, I mean, this gal, Jeanette Silva at Silverware makes the most amazing jewelry. And I'll talk a little bit about, we have a great art gallery. We have a great, all right. And so, um, so they, the, the retailers, the customers, you know, Cat and Iris sent me. And I always ask people, tell them Cat and Iris sent you. I said, I don't know if it'll get you a discount, but but you never know <laughs> but the retailers know that i send them i send them people so that works both ways yeah uh, questions i'm sorry robert you raise your hand yeah uh question uh number one uh insurance number two how close do you say to you uh, an attorney if you have an attorney and number three your uh, relationship with the, any of the water police uh, maryland resource police or anybody like that right the, the let's start with the with the water well, the water police. I have a great relationship with them. They go by my boat on the way out, and I always wave them down. And I talk to Officer Christopher. I know them all by first name. I find out what's going on in their lives, and um, uh, uh, they're, they're, I like having a really good relationship with the water police. God forbid something happens. Um, I want to know them and I want them to know me. So, uh, so it's, it's, it, I mean, I make a point of, 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 of cultivating a relationship with them. Um, in terms of insurance, insurance is, was very difficult for me to get. I do have a carrier now that's underwritten by Lloyd's. Um, they have me insured heavily for liability but very light for the hull. Uh, they don't want to give me much money if something happens to, to her hull um, for whatever reason. Um, probably because if I were to put Salina on the market, uh, her, her fair market price is very small. She's an old wooden boat. People don't want an old wooden boat because of the maintenance involved. And so she doesn't have a lot of value. I spend more to maintain her every year. Well, what I spend to maintain her every year is about half of what she's insured for. So I basically buy the boat every other year. And that's just, that's just the, the reality of it. Um, it's a company, specifically, if you want to know the name of the company, it's Mark Cal. Let me spell it for you. It is, I just happen to have it on my desk. That's funny you asked. M-A-R-K-A-E-L. And uh, the agent, you'd have to contact me afterwards. I could get you my, um, you know, the connection with the, what do they call the insurance um, agency? Or, you know, whoever. 
them. But Marcal is uh, uh, is the insurance company, and they're underwritten by Lloyd's. Uh, uh, what was attorney, attorney, attorney. Oh, do you have a, do you have an attorney? Do you use I, an attorney? Did you use an attorney? Yes, I I do have a, a maritime attorney out yeah. of yeah. Now, actually um, was referred to me. Let me see how that what, what came up. I hadn't had an attorney uh, up until like two years before COVID. Um, and I think it was because I was beginning to think about um, setting Spina up as a foundation. You guys know she's a family yacht and I'm third generation. I often get the question, what happens next? Is there a fourth generation? And there might be but there's more likely to be if she uh, goes into a foundation and the onus isn't only on them to um, maintain and operate the boat the way I have. And if there was a foundation that they would be very active in that and participate, but they wouldn't carry the burden by themselves. And I think that that was when it was recommended to me that I contact the um, attorney in his name, Eugene might come to me, I'll think of it, um, in uh, Annapolis to begin setting that up. And so I haven't finished setting it up. I'm not in a hurry to get it done and I've been busy with other things and it's a long process. Um, okay, just, just one, one last question. It's a tough question and I'm not sure you wanna answer it. When all is said and done, uh, I, don't, I don't think a dollar number is appropriate, but, but percentage, what, what uh, when all is said and done, all expenses, all overhead, dot, 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 what percentage, what percentage, if you're willing to say this, goes into your pocket? That's an interesting question. Um, different years have been different. So more recently, uh, because, probably because of COVID, um, I have uh, been a little better off. You'd think it'd be, be the, the other way around, but with the PPP loan and the, um, there was just a lot of money pouring in every which way and the ridership between the ridership and the, the loans. And I, I will tell you, I wouldn't be in business without that PPP loan because I would have shut down. I was terrified that I was gonna have payroll and not have any ridership. The first two months of 2020, we were shut down. You guys know that. Um, but between that, keeping me floating, and then the ridership, um, this last year percentage, it's not very big. I don't do this for the money. <laughs> I honestly don't know. Maybe okay, that, that's fine. I, I understand, ma'am. That's not a problem. I understand. Yeah, yeah. I, it's, I, I don't do it for the money. Um, when I first was doing it, there wasn't anything left over. The first, okay. uh, the, the first, uh, so I've been taking passengers now since 2002. I took about a half a dozen people out in the fall of 2002. 2003 was my first full season up on Tillman Island, but I was really only part time. And 2004 was my first year in St. Michael's and I was full time. And um, I would say from four until maybe 14, maybe the first 10 years, I really didn't put a dime in my pocket. I made payroll, I made the dock slip, I, I, I made maintenance because we were still doing renovations all through that time. And after that, it was starting in 14, there was a little left over and I figured out I made minimum wage maybe in 2014. <laughs> you know, 2015, it's like I gave myself a 50 cent an hour raise and then it's gone on from there. But, <laughs> it, um, I wouldn't tell anybody to get into the charter boat business to make money. I would get into the charter boat business because you love it and it underwrites the expenses of doing it. If you can feed yourself on top of it, hallelujah. If you can make enough and above and beyond that to put a little aside, God bless you. You're smarter than I am. I haven't figured out how to do that. Thank so you. That's that's an honest answer. If you want the, um, the attorney's name, his name is Eugene Samarin, S-A-M-A-R-I-N. And his phone number is, I have two phones for him. I don't know why. I've got 443-225-4805 and 443-716-4400. And he's at, he's, uh, you can look him up at Boating Law 
Lochner. Ted yes. Lochner. He is part of Ted Lochner's firm, uh, and and we we deal with uh, Ted uh, uh, frequently. Yeah, good point. Okay. And okay. I, I know him personally. I've uh, used him too. Okay. Let me ask. Let me close with two final questions. Sure. Uh, the first is from Craig. Why not upgrade your captain's license to take six pack or more than a six pack? And it, okay. It, so that's, uh, that story goes back to 2001. The boat comes to me. She's not in the best of shape. I figure out that maybe the boat can help. Uh, oh, yay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a paid captain aboard. I didn't know I was going to be the paid captain. I had this kind of idea that I was going to do the Queen's Wave and jump aboard the boat every once in a while, like my grandparents had, you know? <laughs> it was so funny. I mean, truly, truly ignorant. But anyhow. <laughs> Um, I went down the path of getting her inspected so you could carry enough people so that it made sense economically, right? Taking six people out is, is not a good model. <laughs> I can assure you it's not a great model. And the Coast Guard sent an inspector and he comes and he looks at the boat and he says, well, you're going to have to close your scuppers. I said, excuse me? He said, you're going to close your scuppers? Yep. I said, I, I don't understand where how does the how does the water drain out of the cockpit he said you're going to put a grate into the middle of your cockpit and the water is going to go down into your bilge and the bilge pump is going to pump it over and I, I said I I'm I'm can you tell me why why you want the scuppers closed and he said if water can go down it can come up and that was when I realized if I was too stupid to understand that, I was too stupid to have more than six people on my boat. And we agreed to, to disagree. Uh, it was the, the, the amount, the inherent risk, the lack of safety for not having scuppers and now being uh, dependent on a battery and a float switch and a bilge pump and it was nuts. It was absolutely nuts. And I thought, I'm not, uh, you know, how do you fight uh, uh, a city hall? And I just, I just said, fine, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm not going to get her inspected. And I didn't. And then I started hearing stories about people going through inspections and the things that the Coast Guard does with wooden boats in terms of um, the damage that can happen. And I just, I, I just ended up. I have a six pack and we go out five times a day and we kill ourselves and we, I make ends meet. And I'm, I'm fortunate that I don't have to do more than that. I don't have to have an economic model where I'm making a, a, a real living, right? There are other people out there that have figured out how to do that. I'm just not one of them. Well, my last question is why you are not a member of CAPCA? I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I have no idea. I, I really don't. I came to a CAPCA meeting back in Annapolis, I don't know, 15 years ago. And I don't know why I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get signed up. You know, I, sometimes there are people that have businesses in St. Michael's and I asked them, how come you're not a member of the business association? And they said, nobody ever asked. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, I'm asking you, you want to be a business a member of the business association? And they said, well, what's in it for me? And then I tell them what's in it for them and they sign up. That's it. You know, um, I, the, there's a, a wonderful art, uh, um, mu um, it's not really a museum, it's an academy, and they call it the, the uh, um, Academy of the Arts in Easton, and I'm an art hawk I buy art all the time, I go to all of the art functions, nobody has ever asked me to be a member, and I'm not. It's crazy, it's absolutely crazy, but uh, I, nobody's asked me to be a member. I'm like, okay, I'm chump change, that's okay, I, I guess I can handle that. <laughs> So you guys never. I will. I will pass the baton over to uh, our president to formally ask you. Just send send, <laughs> an, send me an email email application, Pat Myers. We'd love to have you as a member. I'm in. I'm in. I'd love to be a member. And more recently, um, you guys were very kind and posted a job opportunity for me, and it's like that was really nice of you guys. I don't know why I'm not a member. I don't know. It got by me. Well, hopefully that won't last long. 
All right. Well, if anybody wants to come for a ride and hear more stories about my grandfather's boat, I have um, uh, uh, the uh, I have a platform for that, and we do show time. <laughs> thank you for having me. Well, thank you very much. Very entertaining and and educational. I look forward to sailing next to you soon. <laughs> All right. Bon voyage. Well, wait a second. We'd like to thank you so much for your very lively and informative presentation. And I assure you, you are invited and welcome to be a CAFCA member. We'd love to have you as part of our group. And so you will be hearing um, from us and we hope you will uh, be filling out your application and joining. Um, and for those um, members who are on the call, I would encourage you to look on our website and you can see um, lawyers and insurance companies who work with um, our members and often offer discounts. And that could be a resource um, as you're um, looking um, for people who work with, um, with our members and in the industry. And just this week, we sent out uh, an announcement about a webinar that's taking place on marine liability insurance coverage. That's gonna be May 3rd at one o'clock and you can look for uh, the link in the constant contact message that was sent out. Um, and if you have an interest in hearing about um, liability insurance and lawyer stories about you know, various situations they've dealt with, um, that may be um, something you might wanna tune into. Um, it's free um, and you can get the link from that um, communication that went out. So I'd like to thank again our speaker. Thank you, Davis, for moderating and thank all of you for attending. And we hope to see you next month at our um, membership meeting where we'll have another very informative um, speaker for you. So thank you all. Bye-bye. Good evening. Thank you.